Welcome to another Board Game Breakfast. I'm Tom Vassell, your host, and you're here to hear all about board games. This has been an incredibly busy weekend, so this may be going up a little later than I had planned on, and for that I apologize, but let's get right into it. First of all, if you back the Dice Tower Kickstarter, again, a huge thank you, but all the Kickstarter surveys have been sent out, with the exception of some of the higher-end ones for people uh, playing games with or eating with us at conventions. The rest, though, have been sent out, and we urge you to please, 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 please send those back in as soon as possible so that we can get working on that and get those out to people. We have several things that you're going to be seeing soon. Top 100 lists we're going to be spreading throughout the year, so you're going to start seeing those. We have Gamma coverage, the Gamma trade show coverage, which is coming up in March. It's still a bit of ways yet, but just keep an eye out for that. We're going to be doing that soon. Today, I'll be doing a question and answer at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I hope to see several of you there. And at, you can and you can start going and asking questions now if you want to on the link that's included in the live Q&A. All right. Well, enough of all that. Let's get to the news. in the news, first of all, we see that uh, Mayfair has talked a little bit more about Agricola. They're re-releasing that now that Mayfair no longer has Catan. They're going to be putting a lot of effort into their other games. And with Agricola this year, they're going to be releasing a new version of it that is one to four players. And then later on in the year, they'll be releasing the five to six player expansion for it. There also is going to be a family edition, which is kind of the version without the cards. And from what I understand, there's going to be some mega collector's edition coming down the road that has a ton of cards that they've made so many cards for Grickle. It's crazy. Fantasy Flight Games has announced Mainframe. This is a game based in the Android most people know it as a Netrunner universe. This one is a much shorter game, a 30-minute game. It looks kind of abstract where you're putting out walls and trying to block people in. Looks pretty interesting. Um, Cabaret has released No Chance. That's K-N-O-W Chance. Uh, Fireside has announced Dastardly Dirigibles, which is a bit of a Euchre variant to some degree. So looking forward to seeing that one come out. This one has me super excited, folks. GMT is reprinting 1960. Now, GMT originally published Twilight Struggle, uh, which was a great game about the Cold War. And then from one of the same designers, Jason Matthews, uh, 1960 came out, which was about the election between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon in 1960. That was published by Z-Man Games, but it went out of print. We haven't seen it for a while. If you saw my top political games, you'll see that that was on the list. Well, now GMT is going to be publishing it, which is very exciting. Uh, I, I, it's just a really, really good game. Stronghold and Eggerspiel have announced a partnership. Now, they've been publishing games together for a while anyway. They've now announced a strategic partnership, which essentially means if I publish a game, you'll publish it too. That's kind of what that means to some degree. So they have some games that they're already announcing, Animals on Board. Most people are going to be uh, pumped about Jorvik, which is a Stefan Feld game. Um, and they've already... Uh, Most people know their partnership already from Village and the games that came from that. USAopoly and Fireside Games, another partnership, the USAopoly will be publishing Star Trek Panic. Now, I have to admit, this one to me seems very weird because we have Castle Panic and we have Munchkin Panic, which are essentially the same game. One has a Munchkin theme. But now we have Star Trek Panic where there's a starship in the middle and you're defending against waves of stuff coming in. I guess it can work, but I'm doubtful. But I, I'm willing to be proven wrong. It just seems like an odd mix for that theme. Steve Jackson has announced Ogre, the sixth edition, which is going to be based on the new one. Um, with uh, I, I guess they're shrinking the box. It's based on the designer edition. There's only one map and stuff, and it basically it's $50, which is a huge difference from their mega giant version that they released. So it, I, I think that's more... Uh, more in keeping with the game itself. I don't think the game is worth hundreds of dollars, but $50 for a lot of cool stuff, that I'd be interested in. 
Nestor Games has just recently published Melting Chest. Nestor Games is one of those companies you should keep an eye on because they publish all these little games. Some of them are okay. Some of them are more interesting than others. The, the name of this one itself makes you want to look at it, Melting Chest. Uh, Asmodee has announced Zany Penguins. The rules for Quadropolis coming from Days of Wonder are now online. And we'll end the news segment today talking about the longest game of diplomacy has finished this week. 105 years. Now that's not real years, that's in game years. The actual game took around just shy of four years. But 105 game years, which is 210 turns, is a really long time for diplomacy. And if you go to Reddit and other places, you can read about this. And they talk about it. It was a very long game. Some guy got knocked out really early. I can't imagine what that's like. Well, yeah, we played the longest game of, of diplomacy. And, and, well, I was in it for the, the first week. <laughs> so it's interesting. And it's even more interesting to see who won this one, which is a country that does not normally win diplomacy. Anyhow, that's what's in the news. Let's get the Kickstarter. Happy breakfast, everybody. There are some cool and some unique things on Kickstarter right now, so let's get going. Fabulous Beast is an ambitious dexterity game that includes integrated chip and app technologies. Players take turns stacking plastic animals on top of a sensor base that works with an app that helps guide the game, keep score, and it adds challenges. The pieces are absolutely gorgeous, and the prototype shown in the video does look functional. That said, Sensible Objects, the company behind the game, is basically new to the game manufacturing business, and this is a mammoth project that includes molded plastics, integrated chips, electronics, and a multi-platform app. With all that going on and the relative inexperience of the team behind the game, I suggest you set your expectations appropriately if you choose to back this, especially at that $84 minimum pledge that gets the game. The Game Crafter has been producing print-on-demand games for years, but in a unique move, they are outsourcing the production on Zerpang. This is a light tactical board game in which players maneuver and battle across the board in order to achieve their location goal. Battle is a bit deterministic because your battle stat is basically how many pieces of yours are connected at the battle, but there are cards that can impact that and cards also drive your movement points. Because Zerpang is intended to have these minis, GameCrafter has partnered with somebody that has injection molding capabilities so that if Zerpang funds, these minis could be included in GameCrafter games in the future. A copy of Zerpang will include 42 adorable minis for a $59 pledge. Friend of the Dice Tower, Dan King, the Game Boy Geek, is looking for help to fund his fourth season. Dan is one of the most prolific game reviewers out there, and his videos always live up to his promise of being high-energy reviews. Dan has arranged for some really cool game promos as rewards, but he also has some unique pledge levels, including consultations with game designers and game publishers with some of the top names in the industry. It's pretty cool. In the follow-up game to Valeria Card Kingdoms, Villages of Valeria is a card-based city-building game that features multi-use cards that can be played as the building so you can get its ability, or cleverly you can turn it around and use it as a resource generator. The game also features a Puerto Rico or San Juan-like action system in which you choose an action the whole table can perform, but you get a better version of it. Villages of Valeria looks snappy to play and has gorgeous card art, and for a $17 pledge plus shipping, a copy of the game can be yours. Escape rooms, or adventure rooms as Scott Nicholson prefers to call them, are growing in popularity but aren't always close or affordable for everyone. Escape Room in a Box is making that experience more accessible and affordable with their project offering a werewolf-themed adventure. The game includes all the props and puzzles you'll need for a one-hour adventure for two to six people. But like many consumable games, this is really a one-time use product. But the publishers have thought about that, and they are planning on creating refill packs in the future for a lower price. A pledge of $45 will get you a copy of the game. And considering that escape rooms can often cost like $30 to $50 per person, that's not so bad. They even include helpful hints and recipes for a themed party setup. And from the creators of the incredibly popular webcomic Cyanide and Happiness comes Joking Hazard. Is this the next Exploding Kittens? It's already off to a huge start. 
Taking a cue from the online comic generator, Joking Hazard plays a lot like Apples to Apples or Cards Against Humanity, but the cards are comic panels, and players compete to be the one who plays the selected final panel to a comic. The $25 game pledge is higher than Exploding Kittens was, so it'll be interesting to see just how high up the Kickstarter ladder this one can climb. Okay, that's all I have for you this week. Did anything catch your eye? Until next week, play all the games. Welcome back to part two. Okay, yeah. So the the little adventure we just did here, Mark was actually the dungeon master. Mark was actually the dungeon master for that. So what are the advantages of a flesh and blood dungeon master versus a digital one? Um, if you're doing a video game, I mean, obviously the advantages that you get is you don't have to crunch any of the numbers yourself. So the math can be really complicated, and the computer just handles that yeah. side behind the scenes. That's great. Uh, graphics have obviously come a super long way. Time I've been playing video games, <laughs> which is you know back starting with the Atari 2600. Um, so yeah, you can really get a rich, immersive experience, especially in a first-person thing. Uh, however, the thing that you're lacking is that if the guy that programmed the game didn't account for this decision or that decision that you want to make, you just can't do it. Yeah. That option is just closed no off. Railroading. The following the rail kind of thing. So yeah, with this kind of thing, the, the biggest advantage you get is player agency. Is that it's just wide open. Uh, the way I typically describe tabletop role playing games to people is it's kind of like a cross between a theater production mm -hmm. where you know you play a character, you have a role, uh, but all the lines are ad libbed. Yeah. Oh sure. Yeah. yeah. So it's like Jen. With, yeah, with a jazz band kind of thing. Okay, so the thing you know that I would add to that is there's the alchemy of a tabletop RPG where you have the dungeon master's preparations, you have the player's agencies, and then you have the luck as well. Oh, right? true. So yeah. all these three things go into preparing yeah. the story rather than just one person saying, okay, here's what happens. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's true. true. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I've, I've heard it said that there are only three types of stories. Uh, a hero makes a, a selfless choice. Okay. A tyrant makes a selfish choice, okay. or fate decides. Oh, okay. And then with tabletop, you get all three. Well, the story that I've usually seen with tabletop <laughs> role playing is that a bunch of murder hobos go around and kill people and take their things. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah, well, there's that. Okay, thanks everybody. Hey everybody, I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. Today's question comes from Deb. And she says um, she wants to know more about female gaming designers, female hobby game designers, and it's hard to find them. Is there many of them out there? And the short answer is there, there's not. It's just, I don't know why exactly. I mean, obviously the hobby was dominated by men for a while, and now it's changing. And we're definitely seeing a lot more Kickstarters with female designers. Yeah. But for a while, there was just not many. We, we looked it up, though. We found some. Susan McKinley Ross. That's Quirkle. Yeah. Uh, although Quirkle's maybe less of a hobby game and more of a mass market style. Yeah, it's, a, it's more a Toys R Us kind of game, I would say. I wouldn't, I wouldn't criticize that, but no. you're looking for hobby game ones. Uh, same would also be for Maureen Hyrone, who is probably the most successful female game designer in the world. She has sold hundreds of thousands of her games. Yeah. Uh, I can't think of a lot of her games off the top of my head. I, I know she did seven, eight, nine, and a bunch of these other small card games. Um, Andrea Meyer is definitely a hobby game designer. Yes, Acta. Yeah, and Mall World, and a few other. Although she hasn't designed a game for almost a decade now, I think it's been yeah. a while. Yeah, it was the early two thousands when she was designing. Carrie Breitenstein. Um, who, with her husband, designed many of the games for Twilight Creations. Her husband has passed away, and she is completely in charge of that now, yeah. and still pumping out the content and lines, not just zombies, but other games. Claudia Healy, she did um, San Santiago, or one of the designers of Santiago. Full designer on Santiago, which is a really good Euro game. It really is. I'm surprised that that one actually has not been reprinted lately. I don't know, maybe it's not great, but it's a solid one. Yeah. Doris Mathau, one of the more famous ones on our list. Yes, yes. I mean, she did <coughs> Usurpe and uh, a lot of games, a lot of games. She's more well-known probably for her artwork. You've seen she did Carcassonne. Carcassonne. Yeah, she's done a lot of artwork, but she's also obviously with, with Frank did a lot of games as well. Right, and it's really interesting because 
her artwork, if you ever see her artwork, is each tile is usually completely different than the others. Yes. I've always liked that about, yes. about her stuff. El Grande, she did the cover on that. That's right, that's right. Karen Seaforth, um, with her husband Andrea Seaforth, did uh, Turn in Taxis. Yes. And Joe Wenland uh, runs and does some games, um, blood and card stock games, like some small take that card games. That's what I, we found on a quick research. I'm sure there's more. Could I just make a rant? Uh, we have so many women now who are joining gaming, and I think there should be more women designers. I, oh, yes. I don't, you know, look at what, at the Dice Tower, we have Suzanne, we have um, lots of people who are well, part of it. Well, we still don't have as many females involved as I'd but, like. Um, the, the new girl who does the crafts and hobbies and... Um, and even when you go to conventions, there's, you know, there's people like Stephanie Straw, and there's all sorts of women who are involved, and it would be great to have more women designers, too. I think that, you know, we need a stronger female presence in the industry, and there would be all sorts of creative ideas. Women are more creative than men, and mm -hmm. I can't imagine, I could imagine, like, all these games that would come out from women that I think would be great, and I hope that more women out there want to be game designers and, you know, have ideas and want to come forward and say, you know, I want to design a game and, you know, push to design a game. All right, go to it. Hey there, this is Mike with the Board Game Makeover. In today's episode, I'm going to show you how I got my kids to play Carcassonne by changing the theme to The Simpsons Carcassonne. Carcassonne is a tile laying game that's been around for quite a long time. It's a gateway game that is easy to teach and easy to learn. I decided to give Carcassonne a theme makeover. In my first attempt to retheme Carcassonne to The Simpsons, I went to the hardware store and picked up these little two-inch tiles. They're regular bathroom tiles, but they work just perfectly for this because I was able to print out the graphics and glue them on, and I glued on the backs, and they're just nice and sturdy and durable. They're not going to break, and very they don't slide around on the table. Very nice. Except, this becomes a very heavy game to take to game night. Well, bigger is better, right? These are eight inch chipboard pieces that I did the same thing to to make see if we could have some fun with it and make it into a floor tiling game. The problem with this is these graphics to print out, so many of them at this size, gets really expensive and it's hard to work with the chipboard. It's not like pieces of wood that are sturdy. And finally is just the time it would take me to finish all this up. There's still so many to do. So. This is one of those projects that I'll finish on a rainy day or never. Hello, Simpsons Carcassonne. This is what the Simpsons Carcassonne looks like. In the Simpsons Carcassonne, you're not making castles, you're trying to make donuts. And each of these four inch tiles represents the exact same duplicate tiles found in the Carcassonne box. I switched out the meeples with little figures found in the Simpsons Clue Edition. These are readily available on eBay and not very expensive. And finally, I created a box to put the pieces in using the Simpsons and Carcassonne box art. Giving Carcassonne a board game makeover took a lot longer than I thought, but for the most part, my kids love playing it, the theme is awesome, and it's part of my collection. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time. Hey, welcome to Painting 101. This week on Painting 101, we're going to be looking at all the wonderful art that has been sent to me again. I get tons and tons of letters each and every week from you guys, sending me your pictures, showing me how you develop, and even helping you in some ways get more out of your models. So let's take a look at this month's artwork that you guys have sent me. So that's it for this week's Painting 101. 
I hope you enjoyed all the wonderful work that everybody has done. And please keep sending those pictures to my email. I appreciate it so much. And you can send them to NovaPrime860 at Hotmail.com. Also, check out my channel, Robert Orn, here on YouTube. And be sure to upvote me on board game links. Until next time, I'm Rob Warren. We'll see you soon. So this week, from the Dice Tower, I'm going to be taking a look at Sly Dice, Trap from IDW. We'll be taking a look at the World's Finest, the newest Dice Master set. Me and Jason will probably be taking a look at an older game. I'll be taking a look at Casting. Um, Kittens in a Blender, well, that's an interesting one. The Storytelling Game, Rush and Bash. Um, and you'll be seeing probably another top 10 list from us. I know we put one out last week, but we were behind schedule. Z is back on board, so you'll see stuff from him this week. You'll see uh, reviews from Sam and from Chaz. Uh, Robert uh, Oren, who has done a lot of painting stuff. You're gonna see more painting videos from him on our channel, so he'll be coming and bringing several of his videos over, and lots of videos from our other contributors. You also see stuff from all the different podcasts. We have a lot of great podcasts. You might like watching our videos, but there's a lot of great audio podcasts, and you can find all those at Dicetower.com. Moving on. Hello, Chaz Marler from of Dice Paradise here, and recently I've been discussing the universe full of intellectual properties that exist in board games, books, movies, and television, and how some of those universes are strong enough to cross over into other forms of entertainment. But last time, I mentioned how it seems that there's barely any board games that have successfully made the transition over into movies. And why is that? I mean, Movies are stories, and stories center around a conflict to resolve. And similarly, board games, by their very nature, center around conflict as well. And yet, most of the existing movies based on board game properties, and those in development, seem to be lackluster at best. So what's going on? Well, let's return to two examples of board game movies that I think best demonstrate what the issue is. Clue and Battleship. Now, both films introduce a problem to solve. One, a murder mystery. The other, how to fit 1400 CGI special effects into 131 minutes of film. The primary difference between the games that the two movies are based on is a lack of character. And more specifically, characters. For example, who is the harried naval commander in Battleship that's calling the shots? It's you. And who's the intrepid settler establishing a city-state on the island of Catan? Still you. Even in Monopoly, you're just projecting yourself onto a die-cast metal race car, unless you're playing with Kevin, who always takes the race car, in which case, fine, I'll be the shoe. Again. Now, Clue had the odds in its favor, because at least that game includes established characters to build a story around. But even then, referring to the persons populating Clue as characters? Yeah, that's still a bit of a stretch. But without established characters, screenwriters have to first invent new ones, often having nothing to do with the game's original premise. And then they have to build a story around that character while simultaneously retaining as much of a tether to the board game that the movie's based on as possible. The end result is a presentation that serves two masters, trying to develop an original new character while simultaneously making callbacks to as many iconic nostalgic things from the game as possible. In film school, I believe they call that approach a hot mess. So are there any other board games that already have that critical blend of conflict and character that's needed to successfully make the leap into other forms of entertainment? Well. That's what we'll explore next. Now, I've got my list of potential board game universes that are fit for the big screen. Which games are on your list? I'm Adam Dork from Non-Traditional Board Games, and this is a new segment I'd like to call... The Notorious Beards and Gaming. Now, you may be asking, who's this guy? What's he got to say about beards? And honestly, not much. But my pick 
Red November. It's a cooperative game for up to eight players, and everybody plays as a gnome and a sub that's stranded trying to wait for safety to come save them because there's krakens, losing air, warheads are going to blow up inside the sub, all sorts of bad stuff. But the most important part are the beards. Let's get to it. As you can see, everybody gets a play of a beard. And they're all different colors, and they're all nice, thick, nice beards. Good mustache, too. Nice little flair. Every character, you can see it's sculpted into the models, have a nice beard. Red November, my choice for beards in gaming. Everybody gets to have a beard. They can have whatever color they want, just like a rainbow. I've been Adam Dork from Non-Traditional Board Games. Be sure to follow, listen to all that stuff, and remember, let's play some games. Hi there, my name is Niels Cyril's Brettspiele, and today we are talking about the best and the worst in Stauffer Dynasty. Here in the US, Z-Man, or in Germany from Hans im Glück, yeah. My absolutely favorite part on the Stauffer Dynasty is when you wanted to take, take an action here in Palermo, for an example, you place your workers here, your little guides and dudes, and take your action here. You spend a lot of uh, workers to just get there, however, in the next round, this king is traveling, and when he's traveling, you get, get all these people, they are here, back into your hand, so you can use this on a later turn. When you are now traveling again, and you put there another one, next turn you get two back, and you save these meeples for the next turn. So it's not really spending them, it's just pushing them into a later action. That is a brilliant idea. Unfortunately, you get some of these contracts at the beginning of, of the game. For an example, this one. At the end of the game, you're scoring seven points for each single meeples you have in that and that area over here. This is an easy one. If you get this one, if you have a meeple in this, 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 and that, and this is really, really tough to solve, you get 18 victory points. However, you can easily take this seven pointer, for an example, two or three times before you get this 18 point thing once. For me, that's a little bit unbalanced, the swingy part of this contract cards in the start of the game. This was my best and worst for the Stauffer Dynasty. Please give me your comments as always and see you next time for Circle Spreadspiele. My name is Niels and then the best. And the This summer I reviewed Arcadia, a game from Ape Games that uh, when it, I played it, I thought the game was essentially broken. Well, lo and behold, it was broken. It's just that they were missing, they had to put some incorrect cards in. And so when those cards came, I played it again and the game was much better. In fact, it was good enough that I actually kept it in my collection. Uh, I also played Tricarion, which I was not a big fan of. Found out I played a rule incorrectly, went back and replayed it again and still did not like the game at all. Well now, one of the biggest reviews we've done in the past few weeks is B Siege from Cool Mini or Not. And we said that there was this problem with the game, we didn't like it, it was essentially way too difficult as a cooperative game and just extremely random. Well, lo and behold, the designers put up some fixes for the game. Uh, you start with uh, these divine three of these Divine Grace tokens per character. Um, and the, the big giant avatar guy can only spawn once per game. Those were two huge problems I have with the game. So people email me and say, hey Tom, you need to review this again. You need to get to it again. And I, 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 I guess my question, which I wonder and I'm thinking about here is, do games deserve a second chance? Now I'm not talking about should you play games more than once, right? Uh, because, for example, in the instance of PC, we definitely played that more than once because we were like, we are missing something, there's something here. And, and I emailed the designers and said, what am I missing? What are we doing wrong? In the case of Arcadia, for example, that second chance that I did helped the game out a lot. In the case of Tricarion, it, it didn't help the game out at all. It didn't really make any difference to me. But is it responsibility of a reviewer 
to go back and someone says, well, we changed the rule for the game. Oh, okay. To play every game twice. Now, every game review that we do, people tell us that we played it wrong if the review is negative. If the review is positive, no one ever, no one ever complains, which is why there's a lot of reviewers out there who only do positive reviews because they do positive reviews and sure, every once in a while, someone will go, you like everything. But that's not too bad compared to when you say a review is bad and then the fans come out and just, just pound on you. A good example for us this year was Ninja All-Stars. And, oh, I played it incorrectly. I missed the point of the game. Blah, 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 blah. And every time that happens, a fan of the game will usually email me and say, you need to play it and concentrate on this. And then the, you get it right. So does the game deserve a second chance in that regard? And my answer to that, after thinking about it for a while and, you know, looking at it from all different angles is no. I really don't think games deserve a second chance. Many years ago, I reviewed a game and we played it and it was just awful. It was essentially broken. It was bad. It was just an awful game. I said so in my review and I got an incredibly long letter from the publisher telling me, what a moron I was. And in fact, a couple of years later, they sent me another email saying the same thing. Um, I kept both emails in case I ever get too proud. I can go read stuff like that. It knocks me off my pedestal. But essentially, they said, you need to play the game 30 to 40 times to get it. And my answer to that is, are you kidding me? See, game publishers and game designers, we live in a society today where there are hundreds thousands of board games. I was looking at all the games that I played in 2015 and the number is like six or seven hundred different games and that is a ton and I did not play them all. I'm still playing games from 2015 now. There are a lot of games being released all the time and your game has to make a splash right away. There can't be any of this, well, why don't you play it 20 times? Clever things start coming out. Now, if your game does that, that's fine. That's great that a game has great strategies and things that come out in the long term. But to say that they come out right away, well, it needs to make that bang right away. It has to. It has to be like, oh, wow. There are clever strategies and things in this that I'm going to learn after many, many playthroughs, but I can start seeing the inklings of them now. The game is fun now. The game is good on its first playthrough. Now, I'm not saying that games should only be played once before you review them. That is not what I'm saying. We play games as many times as we think they need to be played through. And many games need to be played through several times before you can review them because there's just so much going on in that game to best understand how that game goes by. But once we played the game that many times, to then later on say, well, you need to go back and revisit it, you know what? I don't think we do. That game had its chance. And if we feel like it missed that chance, so are many other people. They're going to play the game and pass it off. So there is some validity to that. Now, most of the time, like I said, this is a negative review thing. If we play a game and we love it, very few times will someone say, you need to go back and try that again because this time you're not going to like it. Most of the time, this doesn't even come from the designers and publishers. It comes from the fans themselves because they're very unhappy when someone dislikes a game that they like. And I go, if you only tried it this way, if you only tried it with this number of players, if you only tried it in this setting, you know, if you only played it in a closed cathedral in uh, New York City in a subway that's going out of business at 3 a.m. in a February of a leap year, then you will like it. Yeah. See, we may do Besieged again, but we may not. You know, I know they changed some rules for the game, and those rules honestly sound like they make it better, but we've kind of passed on. There are hundreds of other games that we're taking looks at at this point in time. So I don't know that these games deserve second chances. Sometimes we'll do it. You know, I did take a second look at our, our Arcadia, I took a second look at Tricarian, but that's not always going to happen, despite the emails that I get. Uh, like, for example, Ninja All-Stars. I'm probably not going to go back and take a look at that again. And I know that the, the negative folks from the Dice Tower will often say things to the extent of, well, that's your arrogance showing. You think you know everything. No, I, I don't. Um, I'm certainly willing to have made many mistakes over the years. But at the same time, 
I believe that once we give a game a fair shake, it's got its fair shake and it doesn't need to get another. Now, I know most people are like, well, you didn't give the game a fair shake. Me not liking the game is not the same thing as not giving it a fair shake. But still, I'm curious what you guys think about this. I love to hear feedback on this one because you play a game, you do this, and then the designer has made a change or the publisher has made a change or a second edition comes out and they made some changes that affect how the game. Does the game itself need a second chance or is it more important to move on to the new games that are coming out? Those first chances, do they get a higher priority than that second chance? Some interesting things to think about anyway. Anyway, until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. Greetings everyone, this is Dean with Board Game Social and Super Bowl weekend is wrapping up here in America and with that our obligatory playing of our favorite football games and it got me to thinking about shelf life. Are there certain games that just due to their theme have a limited shelf life? So for example, sports games, sports games can be very limiting in the time of the year that we'll play them but I don't think it affects their shelf life because we'll go back to those same games year after year after year. But a quick glance at my collection of games pointed out a genre that I think does have a limited shelf life, and that is the modern political election game. You know, there are some games that are grail games. Democar, 1960, people are always playing those. But does anyone still play Campaign Manager 2008? Right now, if you look at Kickstarter, the current Kickstarter campaigns, there's at least six that are focusing on the American 2016 election, or at least the political uh, theme of that election. You have Poo Poo Politics, you have uh, Super PACs, you have Greater Evil. If you are one of these people that purchases the games, why do you purchase these games? Are you Do you play it year after year after year? Or do you do it like, I think some people, myself included, because you want to document that particular event in history. You want to document that crazy campaign, those crazy personalities involved. So that when the year 2030 rolls around and you're home around a fire on Fury Road and your son looks up at you and says, Daddy, how did civilization end, you can say, well, it all started in 2016 when we elected. So let me know in the comments below, are there genres, different genres of games that you think have a limited shelf life? Do you still play Campaign Manager 2008? And above all, let's keep our comments bipartisan, people. Take care. So here you can see we're looking at a play mat. This is from Original Magic Art. This is a classic painting, The Great Wave of Kanagawa. Um, this is the, you know, uh, a painting. I guess it's public domain now. And so this is being made into a play map, but this is not really, this is on Kickstarter now, but that's really just a stretch goal. What's on Kickstarter, that's the, uh, the intriguing part, are these. These are essentially magic cards, or they're the magic token cards. Many of the, ma many things in magic require you to put out, for example, might say put out a, you know, 4-4 angel or whatever, and then you either put out a token or some of the magic card packs come with these token cards in them. This set here, which comes off magic, uh, which comes off Kickstarter, has these different things in, but instead of using the Magic the Gathering art, is using different classic art that's come throughout the, the century. So you might recognize some of these famous art piece, like this one here is a copy, is a demon, and it says on here um, who did each one. So this one here is Vincent Van Gogh, and the different cards here, some of them are just famous painting. There's the wave again, and well, actually, I guess I shouldn't say some of these are famous paintings. I recognize almost all of them, and I don't consider myself to be any kind of art critic, so if I'm recognizing them, then probably they're all very famous paintings. And so you have a lot of different things here, which are basically just going to, you know, here's a, a stag beetle. This is a 1-1 one, one insect that you would put out in magic. Now this Kickstarter is doing extremely well. A lot of people obviously like this. This here is for my review of it, and I have to say I don't really like these at all. I'm not opposed to this style of artwork, but my problem with these is they don't match Magic the Gathering artwork. Why would I want to use some weird painting, you know, like this elemental painting, this guy who had made up of fruits. Why would I want to use that over a picture of an elemental? I guess that, yeah, if I don't have the elemental, is this better than a token? I'm gonna go with no, because to me, these take away from the game. I certainly like some of these styles of artwork. I don't like them all. 
But I certainly like some of these styles of artwork. I just don't know that they have any place in a magic game. And it's kind of discordant to me that way. There's this, just this disjunction of noise in a sense. I, I don't know how else to explain it. I like Magic the Gathering artwork, and granted, even Magic the Gathering artwork isn't uniform on all of its cards, although it's gotten much better these days. But some of these, like for example, this robot card here, which is a very famous painting here, um, American Gothic by Grant Wood, but what does that have to do with magic? The guy doesn't look like a robot, doesn't, that, it doesn't fit in at all. So for me, these are a pass, although obviously I'm in the minority. One of the best things about working at Snakes and Lattes is that I get to introduce cool new people to cool new games that they otherwise never would have heard of. Now I get to do this in person at both of our locations in Toronto, but thanks to the power of the World Wide Web, I can visit you at home or at work or wherever it is that you internet and blow your mind via remote. Now that I'm firmly on the government terrorist watch list, let me introduce you to my favorite new dexterity game, Vertigo. Now, if you live in the UK, you may already be familiar with this game under the name of Librium, but the great people at TCG Games have bought the North American rights, tinkered a little bit with the presentation of the game, and they are bringing it to the colonies. Like Jenga before it, Vertigo is a fairly straightforward stacking game, but instead of using blocks, it uses these credit card-like sheets of plastic with holes slotted through them. These allow you to fit the cards into each other, creating uh, a variety of very complicated shapes. Now, on your turn, you take a card, you match it color to color, fit it in a slot, and if you knock two or more cards off, you're out of the game. If everybody manages to get rid of all their cards, then you start reversing the game, removing one card at a time. As players get knocked out, their cards get divided up amongst the rest of the players, and the last player still in is the winner. There is a rule that if you drop a card on your turn, you lose your turn, but I tend to ignore that particular rule because it encourages this. Oops, I dropped a card. I guess I don't go. One of my favorite things about Vertigo is that it is a stacking game you can get better at. You learn how cards can rest. You learn what angles are possible. Another thing I like about it is that the shapes you end up creating are extremely eye-catching. If you're playing this at a table, you will get spectators. Vertigo does have a downside. The color matching aspect of the game makes it difficult for people with vision problems such as color blindness or anyone playing in dim lighting to actually enjoy the game. Now I've had a conversation with the people at TCG and hopefully for future printings they are going to include unique symbols that match up with the colors so that even people with color blindness will be able to enjoy this fantastic game. And that's it for another week of Board Game Breakfast, folks. Thanks again so much for watching. I can't wait till we get out the stuff that we have coming this week. It's going to be a great week. Uh, lots of board game reviews, another top 10. You might see some more of the smaller top 10s and stuff from all of us. Hey, guys, I'll see you at the live Q&A later on. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.